Welcome to Behavior Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. Given the strange and turbulent times that we are living through, Kurt and I decided to reach out to some of our favorite behavioral science researchers and practitioners to get their take on the novel coronavirus pandemic that is shaking the world. These special edition episodes will explore a variety of different aspects of the crisis and our response to each of those aspects through a behavioral lens. We know that you may feel overwhelmed by the crisis already. It seems Every news story, every social media thread, every phone conversation that we have is focused on some aspect of the pandemic right now. While the news and updated information are essential, we're going to take a different tact. We want to try to understand the science behind our reactions and our behaviors and how science can help us cope and move beyond the current crisis. In each episode, we talk with a different behavioral science expert and get their best thinking on an aspect of the crisis. So sit back. Take a deep breath and listen to our special series on behavioral science and the coronavirus pandemic. Margaret Robinson Rutherford, PhD, is a clinical psychologist in private practice with more than 25 years of experience treating individuals and couples for depression, anxiety, and relationship issues. She is a compassionate and common sense therapist whose goal is to decrease the stigma around psychological treatment. She's a podcaster and hosts the Self Work Podcast, available wherever you listen to your podcasts and highly recommended, by the way. And she's also the author of Perfectly Hidden Depression, How to Break Free from the Perfectionism that Masks Your Depression. Margaret, Welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you so much. That's that's a mouthful. Wow. <laughs> I've been busy. Who uh, writes this yeah. stuff? Oh I don't gosh. know. Yeah. Compassion. I like that. Yeah, that's very good. You, you have been busy. You've been doing a lot of stuff. And and one of the things you, you did is uh, the you've written this new book. So for those of our, our listeners who aren't familiar with the book, can you share a brief overview of Perfectly Hidden Depression? What's it about? Sure. It's about, I came up with that term and it's not a diagnosis. It's something that I had seen in my patients over the years that I I, I literally was just writing my weekly blog post and thought, well, you know, maybe I should describe these people. And they were someone with, uh, with whom working with them was a completely different kind of work than with classic depression because in classic depression you're trying to get people to re-engage to you know not quite be so internally focused and to begin to monitor their thinking and everything that's keeping them um isolated anhedonic depressed hopeless helpless all that stuff so you're trying to get them the energy is going outward in, with these people, the energy was definitely guiding them. I, I needed to guide them inward mm. because they could not express painful emotions or experiences. And so, and there was this very happy, well, they are successful, very happy, put together, um, almost bigger than life kind of presentation frequently and uh, highly engaged. They certainly didn't look depressed. They would not tell me they were depressed. They would deny they were depressed, in fact, until I began listening to what they were really saying content wise and how they were, how they were saying it. Mm -hmm. I I remember a a young woman that I saw literally was talking about being raped the week before college and she was smiling. And I said to her, if I could turn down the sound and only watch your face, I would think you were telling me about what you had for lunch, not that you had had this violent sexual encounter, uh, you know, that you've never told anybody about. So anyway, that day I said, I'm going to call it perfectly hidden depression. And I wrote the post, the perfectly hidden depressed person. Are you one? Mm. Well, at that point, my little humble blog post was, if I got 50 shares, I was doing, it was a bang up day, you know? And, um, I, it, it was going viral. It was, people were, my laptop was beeping and I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know enough about what a, you know, going viral was. And then the next day at the time I was uh, writing for the Huffington Post at the time. And um, so they, they published it and I had forgotten that I had left my email at the bottom of the post. Oh, I got hundreds of emails. This is me. It's like, you're in my head. How did you figure this out? How can I get help for this? So I started looking 
Mm-mm. about what was going on in the research and the literature, the popular literature about perfectionism and depression. Y'all are, you know, y'all know that perfectionism has long been understood to be a character trait that's kind of problematic, can be. But was there, who was writing about what I was seeing, that this sort of perfect looking life was beginning to mask, was well entrenched into masking emotional pain mm. and even even depression, even suicidal ideation. I thought I found Brene Brown, of course, Mm -hmm. uh, but even she, I could not find, maybe because she's a researcher, I could not find what, how she was talking about it. And she was talking about how to change perfectionism, but not where it came from. Mm. How did it get started as this strategy for life? So, basically, I'd never thought I'd write a book. I'd never wanted to write a book. I thought, well, Maybe I'll write a book. <laughs> oh, I love that. I think so, the you know, accidental author. There the you ex- go. That's great. <laughs> I should have named the book that because that, that's really true. Oh, my gosh. Um, so I didn't even know how to go about writing a book. So, I, of course, I read a book on how to write a book mm-hmm. and, uh, and then started this process. And all of that, I, gosh, I, I began writing that soon after. I uh, actually did the original post because then I, what I did was just write some blog posts about it as I was trying to figure it out in my own head. What Mm -hmm. is this? And so um, I decided it was a syndrome like codependence is a syndrome. Uh Yeah. It's like a coping mechanism to some degree, isn't it? Yes. Yes. It's a coping mechanism that is, that is actually some people will term themselves as having smiling depression or uh, high functioning depression. Mm-hmm. And that's one kind of thing, but they know they're depressed. They know they had a hard time getting out of bed this morning and they know that they have thoughts about hurting themselves sometimes they know that, but they get up in the morning, they put a smile on their face and they, they walk around and no one knows they're depressed. That's one group of people who I was also very concerned about. I'm concerned about those people, but what I, this group that I was talking about is really almost completely unaware of of this coping strategy that they have used because it began so early. And I believe for many people, it was it's the offshoot of families, dysfunctional families, enmeshed families, mm-hmm. being male, uh, being abused. I mean, whatever, being neglected. I mean, the child comes up with a strategy to survive and it is, I'm going to be very responsible. I'm going to be accomplished. I'm going to make everybody like me, but I'm not going to talk about myself. Mm. Uh, so the, the habit, just if something was painful, it was suppressed and then just stuck back in your emotional closet, so to speak. And just never to be gotten out. In yeah. fact, to be completely denied or discounted. So, um, that's what I'm sort of grappling with. And I'm open to someone saying, I think you forgot this. I go, good. I'm still learning, <laughs> you know? Um, well, it's it's interesting. So uh, it reminds me, I, I went, uh, when I was doing my dissertation, one of the, my cohorts on, on the group that, um, and, and a good friend of mine is actually Dr. Bill Rowitz and his dissertation was on executive angst. And, and he was a, he's an executive coach before he went and got his PhD. And what he had examined or what he found was that many of these people who had high, you know, they were senior level VP, the, the epitome of, of success in everybody's minds, right? They had the great job. They had the, the fast sports car. They had the beautiful family, you know, vacation in France. But they were, they were painfully, they, they were, you know, once he peeled back those layers, they weren't happy. They were feeling like they had to maintain all of this, uh, you know, face to the outward world. Um, but really inside they, they were, they were struggling. And so I think there's a lot of that going on. I think it's probably a little bit different. As you said, it might be more of that happy, smiling depression that, that they were doing, but there's probably some of that in as well in, in what you're talking about. So. Well, I wrote down that term <laughs> yeah. executive angst because I think that's fascinating. And yes, I would, I mean, I have two people, right now as patients who definitely come to mind that that's what they're talking about. And I'm going to go look that up. You go called ahead. out men. I thought it was interesting. You called out mm-hmm. men earlier in your description. Mm-hmm. Talk, talk more about that. Why, why did, why did men come up specifically for you? Well, um, I, I, I see this in women and men, but I, you know, so many 
uh, well, what I said was, may, now I know what you're referring to. Okay, so I think in many regions of our country and internationally, it's men still get the message of, you know, stoicism, uh, stiff upper lip. I mean, um, that 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 is not something that often they are encouraged to explore. They're more painful feelings, they're darker feelings. And so I think if I, I came up with a nine paths to perfectly hidden depression, I think is one blog post and being male was one of them. Mm. Um, and, but what I decided for the book and actually the publisher helped me decide this um, was that I wasn't going to try to come up with the ways or write about it in a chapter of the book, the ways you can get there. There are multiple, there are multiple roads to Rome, so to speak, but it's m- mostly this, um, this idea that even just growing up in a family where, you know, if you cried or if you, you were, or if you got angry, you were sent to your room, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't do that kind of thing. So um, there can just be a lot of ways. And again, I think being male is one of them. Mm, That's very interesting. So uh, given that we are in this crazy pandemic time and that there are a number of changes and uncertainties that are going on uh, that probably induce stress and anxiety and a number of other things. What, what lessons from this book and how, how does that play into people who either have perfectly hidden depression or just people in general? What are some of the lessons that you can uh, take from the book or from your, your own practice and apply it into today's situation? You know, I've heard two different messages from my folks who struggle with some sort of this perfectionism that's going on during this pandemic. One is that without the feedback from their accomplishments and their tasks and their Mm. jobs and, you know, without this sense of external verification or affirmation that they because that's where they find their value in what they do. And yeah. not who they are, but in what they do. What I had a patient sometimes. She goes, "I'm not a human. I'm a dooman," is what she said. Oh, so wow, um, yeah. So it is without that, you know, and sitting at home trying to take care of your kids, and then their anxiety can really skyrocket because they don't know how to internally soothe themselves. Um, it is in being that successful, accomplished person that they. They, their anxiety is quelled. Um, and then the other thing I've heard, so I'm hearing a lot of that, and then I'm hearing that um, with more tasks, with more roles they're trying to play, that they have to do all of those roles perfectly. Mm-hmm. So it is the stress of that and the pressure of that is really untoward. Um I, I worked with a woman uh, a couple of weeks ago that was just berating herself with shame. Y'all got to remember shame is at the essence of all this. Um, the message of just carrying around a lot of, of a completely uh, potent inner critic that's constantly uh, editorializing about your choices in your life and not in a positive way, in a very critical negative way. And so um that critical voice is saying, you must do, you know, you got to be super mom here or super dad or whatever it is. And so I'm hearing about people staying up, you know, until two and three o'clock in the morning because they are just talked to somebody yesterday because she's, um, you know, it was a birthday for one of her friends. And so she had to, she had to make the perfect birthday parade. And then she came home and she had work to do. So she had to do that perfectly. So it's just nothing gets taken off their plate, you know? And so in the pandemic, that plate is getting huge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say, even though a lot of these things are unfamiliar, right? Well, one of the things that this sheltering at home has done is totally upset the apple cart on what our normal routines are. So we're doing oh, all these yeah. things differently, right? This right. Must add a tremendous burden to to people who, who suffer from this level of perfectionism to try to conquer all these new fields, these new approaches, as you said, these new and different roles, it, it must be daunting. I think it is. And that's what I'm hearing. I'm, you know, a lot of people have started coming to me because of this, because of me writing about this. And so, you know, I have right now, I don't know, um, 
half a dozen people who are who are struggling with this, and that's exactly what they're saying, Tim. Wow. Wow. Is that it's just this? Um, I mean, I you know by now I'm someone they trust to show how they really feel, but you see, you know, not only do they they have a lot of anxiety and and shame about that, but they cannot let anybody see it. Mm. So, you know, they're calling me or contacting me and saying, I'm really having, you know, but I'm the only one right now that knows. So, you know, part of the beginning thing, it seems like a very simple thing. Um, uh, in fact, it's the, it's um, t- telling someone about who you really are, even if it's just sometimes I'm, I'm not the person you think I am. Just a simple statement like that is is enough to get you started. And and given that we are so close, if if you're stuck at home with your family, you are around them now 24-7 and there's no escape from that. So keeping up those pretenses, I think, has to be even more challenging for these people or they're feeling the stress of that. Is that something that you're seeing? I think that's very accurate. You know, one of the things that it was uh, so curious to me um, that people have asked me is they say, well, surely someone's partner knows they're doing this. You know, surely uh, they can see that when their best friend moved away to around halfway around the world, that they didn't cry, that they didn't seem gloom. I mean, they just, well, you know, it's life. I'm not a crier, you know, whatever. Um, and, or they've noticed other things that have happened, but what happens is, now I have not done research on this, so this, this is my own thinking, guys. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but I have thought a lot about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, is usually they can be attracted to someone who is, who wants also a perfect looking life. So uh-huh. it's been, they have a fairly superficial relationship. They look great to everybody else, but they're really not. I think they could be, um, they could be attracted to, or someone who's an underfunctioner would be attracted to this person who's a very much an overfunctioner. Mm. So there's actually an investment in him or her remaining just as driven and, you know, because I don't want to do it. Let, <laughs> let them do it. <laughs> and then I also think that they could be attracted uh, or narcissists could be attracted to this kind of person because who better to handle your narcissistic treatment than someone who's going to take oodles of responsibility, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Oh, well, yeah, you know, I did raise my voice. It must be my, you know, you're right. Blah, blah, blah. But I do think that there's a subset because I know um, that I've been contacted by partners of people who say just exactly this, that, you know, she, she's only sleeping um, five hours or four or five hours a day and a night. And, you know, she never complains. And, you know, I, but I'm, I, I feel like I don't really know her. Mm. Um, I, I've wanted to talk with her about this and she just avoids talking like the plague. So there are some signs that you're in a relationship like this. And obviously if you're together 24 seven, then that's going to be tough. Denial seems to be a word that uh, keeps coming up that fascinates me. And I think about so much of our behaviors are, our behaviors are a mix of DNA and context and, you know, um, how we grew up and all those kinds of things. Sure. Where does, where does denial get to be such a big, part of us how how does that creep in that's a really great question i think my my thinking is that it's because you you get the ben you reap the benefits of it as a child Mm. um that you know we we develop these strategies and one of them is to stop paying attention to what your gut is saying to you or stop paying attention when you want to cry or want to get angry and because you gain the benefit your your dad laughs instead of taking another drink um you get acclaimed at school where you're being you know screamed at at home you get there are benefits to you beginning to well not just beginning but to having the habit of pretending or staying keeping things invisible to yourself or just you you don't want to recognize how bad things are. And so you just push away whatever feelings you have and suppress them, deny them, dissociate from them, whatever you want to call it. And as you're reaping the benefits or what you seem, what seem to be benefits to you at the time, then that's becomes your way of emotional survival. Mm. And 
th- then what happens is we move that survival strategy into adulthood with us and it, it doesn't work <laughs> or it starts not working. I mean, um, and I have found that it is compassion that is really what people do not have for themselves. Again, I'm remembering a, a guy, he's just so vivid in my memory. He'd actually been drugged to therapy by his wife because uh, they were having some problems. And then those kind of got, actually, he was drinking a lot. He had retired and he was drinking way too much. And But they had some other issues. And so, but that was one of them. But he came back in by himself and he said, I've just got to talk to you about something. And as he was telling me about his childhood, he started laughing at this big boisterous laugh and he was laughing. And so I thought he was about to tell me something funny. And he said, you know, my mom used to scream at me and she'd come outside and she would chase me outside and we had big rocks and she would pick them up and she'd throw them at me. (laughs) And I looked at him and I said, do you realize you're laughing? He goes, oh, yeah, you know, that was just my mom. She was crazy. And I said, I want to ask you something. If if one of your children or grandchildren, he had grandchildren by this time, if, if you saw an adult throwing rocks at them, would you laugh? And he said, well, of course not. And I said, so why are you laughing now? This isn't funny. That little boy is still inside of you. And what had happened was that he turned into this mega – a successful person who uh, very was in the one of our local industries here and was highly regarded, and he was a workaholic. Well, guess what? When he retired, he didn't have that sense of affirmation anymore. So he began drinking to try to escape, and then all of a sudden, he discovered his work. His work was to go back and acknowledge what had happened to him as a child and the things that that had put into place. Mm-hmm. So do you think with the the coronavirus and and as you talked about in in your book one of the things you talked about denial is that it has this it can get in the way of awareness and of mm-hmm. mindfulness right sure. so there's this piece of denial getting in the way I, I can see where uh, as you just mentioned this this uh, the the last story that you just told uh, the coronavirus might be eliciting some people out of that denial or, or maybe forcing them to, to face that denial. Are, are you seeing that or could you uh, extrapolate out to see where that might happen? Is that something or am I way off base in, in my thinking around no, that? No, it, it's a definitely an extrapolation. <laughs> because, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm going to answer your question in kind of a round the barn kind of way. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm from Arkansas after all. You know? <laughs> um, so I got, I got a barn too. So I'm just, I get it. <laughs> The first, the very first exercise in the book, okay, there's like over 60 of them. So it's more of a workbook, obviously, than it is a book, is to simply come up with a mantra, just a short phrase. And I give us some examples of where you are and where you, what's the very first step. Like, um, I want to be kinder to myself or I want to learn how to play or whatever it is. I've had a lot of people, well, a lot. I mean, it's not a New York Times bestseller, but (laughs) (laughs) it's a lot for me. Come up, say to me, I've had to skip the first exercise because I can't come up with the perfect mantra. Oh, wow. And I write all these down and I think that's not, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. And so I said, so there's your mantra. And, and both the, these were both women who talked to me. And I said, what do you mean? And I said, I want to be able to come up with a mantra. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you are. So you just take yourself where you are, and that becomes your mantra. But these folks, the reason why I thought about this, as you said, what's happening during the pandemic, is I do think that whatever sort of ritualistic behavior, maybe even a little OCD behavior, because people can't have OCD that, you know, or problems with panic and anxiety um, that have, um, again, it's a syndrome, it's not a diagnosis, but could struggle with perfectly hidden depression. And I, I do think it is, it is, they're realizing that even the most simple of things, now that life has gotten simpler in some ways, yeah, that they're carrying around a lot of anxiety about how do I even do this very simple thing absolutely perfectly. And 
what has what is shining more of a light on it, I think, is that um, it just it's it's not as complex as their normal world, but their perfectionism remains. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Well, and as you said, there may be a bigger plate of many things on it. So right. while it's simpler, it may be more, and the, it still lends itself into that whole aspect of it. You know, I am I just. I had this thought all of a sudden. Um, I want to tell a story that's a true story. It was two weeks ago now. I got a LinkedIn message from somebody who was interested in talking to me about the book. And so we set a meeting and everything. And she said, but I have to tell you why I'm interested in your book. And she said, I have a friend who just told me about a friend of hers that died by suicide. She was successful, engaged, productive, loving mother of, I won't say how many. And she said her husband told the friend of a friend, no, no, the friend that he had found my book on her nightstand Mm. after she died. And so the thing we haven't talked about yet is the very seriousness of some of this that um, actually I have in my meeting with this woman, um, she also told me that they've had three suicides in this last year in this little area of the country in which they live of perfect looking moms. Mm. And so um, this can be very, very serious for someone. And they can truly, I mean, Kate Spade, of course, I think she's being treated for bipolar disorder, but she didn't want anybody to know. Mm-hmm. And so this is a, um, I think, and so do some of the researchers up in Canada that have done all this work on perfectionism and depression, that perfection, the rising rate of perfectionism is one of the reasons we're also having a rising rate of suicide. So when you think about the severity of of this um, and for, you know, any of the listeners that we have on here, what are what are some of the signs if you were? Again, as you said, you know, sometimes spouses and even close friends may not know this. Are, no. are there signs that you can identify uh, with with somebody else in order to to help say, hey, you know, let's let's ex- actually explore this because I think this could be could be important. Well, there are um, as I came up with them when I was writing the book, I called them ten traits of perfectly hidden depression. You can look for those traits, but again, some of that is not going to look like illness you because know? it's because it's internal to them, and so you it's it's, it's just again they're they're projecting this perfect world on the outside, right. but it's all the stuff that's going on inside with them. But it's, yes, that's exactly right. But you know they're going to their lives are going to look perfect. They're going to be very successful. They they will not tell you about the shame that's fueling that. They're very responsible. They they worry a lot. They need a lot of control. That's something you might see. Gosh, you know he needs a lot. He's he's just not comfortable with. He can't even ride in the passenger seat, you know, or something. You know, uh, <laughs> does that ring true for anyone? <laughs> I'm not raising my hand, <laughs> but sounds um, familiar. I, I prefer to actually ride in the passenger seat. It's like, hey, you want to drive? Perfect, awesome. <laughs> um, you're going to see them never be vulnerable. You're, they're going to say things to you like, if you even said, well, you know, you never really say what your your childhood was like. And, and they'd say to you, oh, you know, it's n- not worse or better than anybody else's. And, I'll, you know, if I wanted to let you know, or if I needed to talk to you, I would. No, they wouldn't. They would have absolutely no desire to talk to you. There's a real fear of exposure and vulnerability. Uh, that's why Brene Brown's work is so important to these folks. There's also a... Uh, they're just uh, continually in motion. They're very successful, but they don't really know how to be emotionally intimate. They're also people who are, John Cobbett zinn calls it, uh, and I'm sure he's not the only one, but I, I read it from him, called rigid positivity, meaning that if something happens, they are always going to say, you need to count your blessings. You know, this is, these. you need to have gratitude, lots of gratitude. And I'm, of course, we need to have gratitude. I mean, the three of us are sitting here and we have, don't have COVID. I mean, I'm very yeah. grateful about that. But at the same time, all blessings have what I call underbellies, meaning they have things that are hard about those very blessings. And you can sometimes, in fact, it's important to connect with those. I, I, I call it an underbelly because I 
I've used this analogy a lot. If you if you see a rock and it's it's on a sidewalk that you've walked, you walk it every day of your life. And you step on the rock, right? It's a blessing that rock is there. You know, um, you use it, you step on it, it keeps your feet dry. But if you turn that rock over, it's mossy and wormy <laughs> and, you know, it's dark and it's got a lot of moisture in it. And, you know, it's there's an underbelly. It's the same rock. Your strengths have, uh, they have vulnerabilities that come along with them because it's the same thing. Mm. Uh, I've written a book and it is a blessing. It got published. The underbelly of it is that, I mean, there are a lot of feelings that come along with that, of vulnerability, of um fear you know my mother is deceased so maybe nobody's gonna buy it (laughs) you know that that, that one one for sure sale is gone yeah Yeah. (laughs) you know will i be exposed will people go you don't know what you're talking about you know who are you to write a book i mean there are all these feelings that come with it that are just they have to be managed and i it's not that i'm not grateful i'm extremely grateful but i'm also having to deal with a sense of eek (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah. A, a friend of mine who is a musician uh, said, you know, what I really, really strive for on my next record is to be have is to have something that I'm proud enough to have a thousand copies of it in my basement. <laughs> but I, wanted to, I wanted to go back to, uh, you know, we are really blessed to have this conversation with you uh, because you're so deeply entrenched in your clinical work. I mean, you are working with people all the time. And I'm wondering, how have things changed? Uh, pre sheltering in place to to actually now where we have lots and lots of people who are you know they've been kind of in this lockdown mode how uh, it, to what degree has your practice changed i've seen a lot of people's dogs <laughs> I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't know about their dogs their dog will want to need to go outside or their dog will be you know whatever so i've met a lot of dogs a friend of mine and i were talking about this for the therapist it's different because there's a huge difference in energy. Yeah. When you're in the room with someone, there is a easy exchange of energy, energy and you read their energy and you, you respond to their energy. And that's much harder to do via telehealth. Now I've only done telehealth for eight weeks and maybe it gets better as you, now I've been able to do that. I mean, people have uh, been vulnerable, still are being vulnerable, but it is a, uh, I find after, five or six sessions, I'm probably as tired as I would be if I'd had eight normal ones. Oh, what, that, that, that's really interesting. You're, you, as, as a therapist, are expending more energy mm-hmm. in each of your sessions? Mm-hmm. Well, we've heard similar things just from uh, business people talking about meetings, right? Where, you know, a, a normal day, they would have five or six meetings, you know, in a row. And they're saying, you do the same five or six meetings via Zoom or some sort of teleconference, and I, you feel just so exhausted. There's something about the the video aspect of it that we're not we're not accustomed to. As you said, there's an energy that you get from people when you're in person with them, and you're missing that energy. And so I think there's some uh, elements of that that we have to take into account. Uh, uh, so yes, as a therapist, I think that's that's key. I think as anybody who is doing this and as part of their new work, uh, it's a whole new aspect of we're not being able to to take some of that energy or give some of that energy to some other people in this new relationship of how we we do work over video. Yeah, I think so too. And one of the things that a lot of people have told me about and. Uh, I certainly struggle with when I first doing Facebook lives is how do you get beyond your own ego uh, talking to you about the way you look, you know, (laughs) and, um, oh yeah. I mean, you know, just, I remember some of the first Facebook lives I did for the mighty, I'd just be talking along and then all of a sudden I'd kind of go like this. (laughs) I'd fix my bags, you know? Well, what, that's a, that's an interesting thing. And it's something fascinating. And I've thought about is, is what is this world that now, 
uh, and, and, and think about this from your, your therapy session, right? If you're doing something with somebody, they're looking at themselves talking to you. And that's yeah. normally not how we, we no. don't get to see our, we don't get to see our own expressions. Mm -hmm. And I often find in, in, in some of my videos, uh, even like as we're doing now, I'm trying to focus in on your face and Tim's face. And then, but I get drawn back and oh, yeah, sure. looking at, at me and what I'm do going, I look like? how, how do I look? And, and I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. fix my collar. Do yeah. And then, and then you go, did they see me look at myself? <laughs> Ooh, gotta hide so, that. But that's a that's a piece of what goes on today, and and how do you how do you manage that, and, and what kind of issues does that bring up? I mean, that that can be a whole different, <laughs> so a whole different conversation. Sounds like you need a therapist, Kurt. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to put something over my own picture here, and like well, in fact, that out. I, I I used to use this more gallery, the way the gallery kind of thing that you're using right now, and I've changed it uh, to where I'm big and that they're little. You know, I oh. use Zoom, and so they can't see themselves very well. But I do think that from what people have told me, some people are actually more comfortable, interestingly enough. Some of my people who are a, a little more uh, withdrawn when they're feeling with their feelings, yeah. they, they say they get – uh, one woman said, you know, I get more nervous coming to your office. It's like at least I'm at home in my own digs oh. and or I'm outside or I'm walking or something, and I don't quite feel as overwhelmed by the experience. And that was information for me. I mean, I didn't know that she felt overwhelmed before, but she's someone who is very shut off. Um, in fact, she's one of these people that I'm helping with this concept. Other people have been blatantly said, I don't like it as much. You know, I like your presence. I like, I like the energy that I get from you personally. And so, and, and so they are waiting anxiously to come back in that other people i think and a lot of people have said it's hard to look at myself and of course i'm sitting there looking at myself all day so that's kind of like Ugh. right um what i've tried to do is keep people uh i'm a very well what did you call me in the intro compassionate <laughs> comments <laughs> um but i'm really direct i'm very yeah. proactive and so i will say things like you know how are you experiencing this and what, I mean, we talk about the process as well as the content. So, because I want to know if there's something about the process that's bothering them, that then I can try to address that. Mm. Um, you know, do you hear me all right? You know, it, it's it, just some of the, you know, people are bothered by the visual getting wonky and, and having to wait for that kind of, uh, for that to subside. Um, so that is a problem sometimes. Um, but overall, although at the very beginning, now back in March, I had some people say, I'm just going to wait. You know, it would make me more anxious to try to work this out than, yeah. it would, than it would add to my sense of stability. I had a couple people that were fairly, fairly new that said they didn't want to do it because they didn't really, you know, we didn't have that connection quite yet. And so, um, but I'm still seeing 30 people a week. So, so it. It, it, you talk about those people who are new, right? And so that that brings up another interesting aspect of this virtual world that we are kind of in right now. And, and again, different people are coming out of it different times. And so this may not be a long term thing for everybody. But you know, we, we've gone through this. And the idea of building that relationship up in a new way, right, as opposed yeah. to an existing relationship. And there's a there is a lack of something, in, in my opinion, that we don't get when you you meet somebody face to face, person to person. Uh, there's a different, as you said before, there's a different energy around that. But yeah. I think that comes particularly true in uh, a new situation. And we've talked with some sales leaders in various different pieces who. Uh, you know, they're going, it's been great for the, you know, we've been able to do some things from sales, business to business sales from a, a perspective of our existing relationships, but it's very difficult to do yeah. this with new people, new clients, et cetera. And I'm just wondering. That's interesting. What, what, so it sounds like you've seen that same thing with some of your maybe newer clients, but I'm sure even within this, have you gotten new clients and, and how has that mm -hmm. process been? You know, it's interesting that you say that because I was sitting here listening through the ears of is this a generational difference? Because the the uh, my two the two people that I've taken within the last couple of weeks are in their twenties, uh -huh. so it may be that they're a little more comfortable than 
you know, those of us who are a bit older, uh, I mean, they've grown up taking selfies and taking pictures of their food and, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, uh, so, I, but, well, I, I mean, it all counts. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. It all, but I mean, I know I've talked about this many times is my, my 14 year old son, I, you know, I've, I've talked about this where a Friday night before this whole pandemic, not that different than a Friday night after the <laughs> pandemic, right? He's he's yeah. sitting in his room on the computer playing a video game with his friends that are on the yeah. phone and they're they're yelling at each other on the phone, but this is how they they interact. I go, Well, why don't you just go meet with him? He goes, Why? You know, it's like exactly. oh, I, I don't need you know, yeah, we're playing. Exactly. This is how we we communicate. So there might be you bring up a really interesting point. There there could be some really generational differences in how oh, we yeah. are, you know working through this i i have a 25 almost 26 year old son and i actually after i started blogging uh, back in 2012 i apologized to him and he goes i said i owe you an apology and goes for what because in high school he used to tell me that he would have these friends and i really thought it was sort of an insecure sort of thing where he was talking about these friends that I never met and never saw. And I thought, it's just kind of like they it, never came over to the house. What is delusional? I mean, what's going on? You know. Uh, and now, eight years later, I have all these friends that I've never met. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I would say, "Oh yeah, she's a friend of mine." You know, yeah. and it's like now I get it. I get it. <laughs> and I think there's something to that too, right? The times are changing and we, we are, we are learning new tricks and uh, maybe the COVID has, uh, has kind of accelerated our, our adopting of these new ways of interacting and, and doing things. And so, you know, there's some positives that could come out of this uh, in the end too, uh, the, with everything else that's going on. So, yeah, I, I actually was in the middle of getting a telehealth certificate when I started having to do telehealth. Yeah. Uh, so I have a, another half of training um, uh, to do, but it's a, like a 12 hour training. That's the most basic you can get. Um, but because people have asked me to see them, of course, there's the licensing issue where I can't do therapy with anyone outside of Arkansas. Yeah. Um, so if I call it therapy, I, you know, that's, yeah. So you can call it consultation. You can call it a lot of things just so you don't call it therapy. But I, I do think some of my patients may say, in fact, I've already been asked by two of them who are working moms saying, you know, could we, even after this is over, could we continue this? Cause it's so much more convenient because they work yeah. from home or whatever. They could just zap on. And as far as I'm concerned, as long as they're making progress toward their goals, um, I'm fine with it. Um, yeah. if, if it stops or it gets kind of stagnant, then, you know, no, come on in. So it could be a blended approach, right? You could, yeah. you could have, uh, you know, once a month meeting in person and other touch points, you know, virtually with these people that might be struggling with perfectly hidden depression. I would not want to see them via telehealth all the time okay. because it would allow them. This is one more barrier, you know, between you and me <laughs> and that kind of sense of, I see it in your eyes. I, I know I can see it behind your eyes. I can see the, the tears that you don't want to cry. I can see I can see that on a screen. But as a therapist, you, you containing emotions. You're you're mm -hmm. a container, and it's an old psycho psychoanalytic term. But it's you know you want to give them a safe place to be able to begin to connect with that thing that they've an emotion that they've never connected with perhaps yeah and i think that's very hard to do i we a, a patient did it a couple of weeks ago and i was amazed he must have just been ready yeah and he just sobbed which i was so glad to see um you know and something a therapist only a therapist would say <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but you know that's not the goal but it was it was such a release for him and that's yeah. what he said. I've, I've never allowed myself to express this. So it can happen, but certainly in trying to establish a new relationship with someone, I would find it, given my uh, great age, I would find it very difficult to do that, I think. When you, we were talking a little bit before, you mentioned music. And I was just yeah. wondering, do you ever use music in any of your therapeutic endeavors? Uh, yeah. Well, sure I do. Um, actually, I was a professional singer in my 20s, and so I sang jingles and TV and radio advertisements during the day, and then I had a little jazz group at night, so um, 
I wasn't all that good a jazz singer, but I tried. And so um, what got me into this, you know, becoming a psychologist, I, I had a, I had been in therapy a lot, which had been a very positive experience for me. But this guy named Ivan came one night and he was subbing for somebody. He was the bass player. And Ivan was getting his degree in music therapy and told me all about it. And so I literally looked into it. I wasn't all that happy um, in the music business. It was I didn't like what it was doing to my own choices personally. And so I put all the money I had in the world down on the first year at SMU in Dallas. And I ended two and a half years later getting a music therapy degree. And then, um, but I did my last internship at a psych hospital and I thought, Oh no, 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 this is what I want to do. Oh. But yes, I do use music. Uh, not obviously as actively as I would, if I were it's still maintained my certification as a music therapist, but I will have people. In fact, I use all the creative arts. Um, I will use music. I will use art. I will use uh, sculpture. Um, I'll use whatever the patient feels drawn to do. Then they'll either write a poem or they'll, you know, find a song that elicits a certain kind of feeling in them. Or we can, you know, I've had uh, people when they've done the trauma timeline, they've often, which is a practice that um, about how to emotionally uh, connect with things that happened in the past compassionately. Um, anyway, they'll, maybe they'll create a song about that particular time in their life, or maybe they'll draw um, pictures and paintings and that kind of thing. I, oh yeah. The perfect office I would have would be, you know, you'd have a waiting room, you'd have a therapy room, and then you'd have, you know, with me, and then I'd have this huge creative room that people could then go afterwards and create something, you know, that yeah. they could mean. And so I've never had that office. I probably never will, but that would be my perfect therapy, therapy <laughs> office. Actually. I love that. I just yeah. love that. I think that that's terrific. I can just imagine what uh, an, an office setting would be like when you have this studio space to go to. Yeah. Instantly, yeah. um, and I have I have sung to the occasional patient. <laughs> <laughs> you have uh, well, you know. I mean, I mean, I can remember two in 20, over twenty five years, <laughs> um, and I'm not. I'm gonna actually not even say what they were because they're a little embarrassing. But um, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> well, I can I, remember. I gotta ask. I gotta uh, ask. <laughs> well, let's just say there was an appropriate time for me to sing this little ditty. Um, let me see if I can remember. I can. I can't remember all of it. Chicken, chicken, what's good enough for me? Chicken, yeah, chicken. Something. <laughs> I, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> for the little chick, H for the mama hen, I, cause I love that bird, C. What's the C for? <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember. For some reason, I don't know. I was getting silly, and they were. They were. So I sang my song, and I thought, you know. They might take away, but my the P of my PhD. If they do, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's fascinating though. The uh, music does as as Tim has taught me um, over over the course of two and a half years of doing this podcast. The, the the insights that you can get from music and the the impact that it has on people is much greater than what I think a lot of people just just believe. There's something about that. And so, you know, you singing a song or using having them, you know, come up with a song or any even just listening to music uh, is is really powerful, much more so than I would have ever imagined before before joining Tim and his <laughs> crusade to to make me uh uh appreciate music you're more. a pianist tim is that right you're uh, a guitar pianist. oh guitar is my main instrument yeah guitar oh that's wonderful yeah. Yeah. we ought to start a little group american <laughs> uh, uh, american folk he we we have some behavioral groove songs that that we, really? we have actually we we've we've uh, produced and we just uh we haven't we have an album that uh we have all, all set to go. It You're be kidding. Be, no, no, That's not kidding neat. at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, neat. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll see about that. But yeah, <laughs> songs, about, songs about behavioral science, Margaret. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, Margaret, this has been really fascinating. And thank you so much for sharing your insights. And thank you for, sure. for your time. We appreciate it very much. Well, it's been a delight. Thank you all. Welcome to the special edition grooving session where Tim and I groove on some ideas and concepts that were inspired by our conversation with Margaret. 
All right, Mr. Houlihan, what inspired you on this conversation? Margaret was so hopeful. I got to say, just, you know, thinking about our conversation with her, she really had this warm, warm, hopeful vibe about her. And I really, I really appreciated that and liked it uh, well, and, and found that important at the time. You know? Well, and even, even from this perspective that she is working with people who are not in a good spot. Yeah. Right, that her work is really focused in on people who are going through a very difficult situation because of of some of the issues that they're facing and and the way that they they deal with it, and and to be hopeful in that I think is great. I you know I, yeah. I one of the reasons I picked IO psychology as opposed to clinical or counseling or any of those that where you're having to actually listen to people and and work with them about their issues is is I don't know if I could be a good person after having to deal with that day in and day out. I, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's hard. It's hard, hard work. Yeah. And, and I, I am so grateful for people like Margaret who do that because it is a really important work. Uh, it's just work that I don't think I, I could do. I would, I'd go bonkers. Because he would take it so serious, like he would take every individual client's uh, issues like to heart. Is, is that I think it? that's I think that's part of it. I think there's the aspect of of you know having this view. So I, I go back. Uh, I you know when I first got out of college, I worked for ITT Consumer Finance, and in that job, uh, I was a loan officer, and and I gave out loans to to people. They were loans of last resort, so these people couldn't get loans anywhere else. But as part of that, um, we had to do our own collections. Right. So so half of my job is is closing these loans. Half of my job is collection. So I'm calling people up on a daily basis. Hey, you're late on this payment. You're late on this. You know, at the end of the month, we'd go out and do chases where I'd actually go do collections. I'd knock on people's doors asking them for money. You would literally go to someone's house or apartment and knock on their door and say, give us the money. Give us or the, you- give us the stereo. Yeah. And and so I would be doing that. I have lots of interesting stories from that time in my life. But what I realized really quickly is that I started off and those people in the loan, you know, in the booth as we're closing the loans, I'd be like, oh, great. I'm helping these people out. They're buying this new TV. We're getting a loan for them or whatever that would be. Uh, but shortly after having done this for a while, I started viewing each of those individuals as, are, am I going to have to be calling you in two months? Are you going to be one of those people who I'm going to have to go out and and knock on your damn door because wow. because the vast majority of the uh, you know 95 percent of the people 96 percent of the people paid on time but it was that four percent that I was dealing with all the time so my my thing about going into this clinical part and viewing the world. Uh, is is that I'm seeing the world? I'd, I'd end up seeing the world through all of these people, and it would come to taint my otherwise perspective of the world as being a, a, a overall a good place because I'm dealing with these people who it's not a good place. So hence, hence IO psychology. Hence IO psychology, as we used to say, we deal with normal people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the business world. I don't know how normal that would be, but yeah, they're but not anyway. normal in the business world. But at least no. you're dealing with many people at a time, and you can deal with norms uh, and large groups rather than individuals, right? Well, and and you're looking to accentuate the positive as opposed to necessarily, um, you know, try to get rid of the negative. So uh, yeah. that's, that's part of it too. It's a positive psychology perspective, various different pieces, uh, but we digress. <laughs> we did di- digress just a bit, uh, but back to Margaret. Because, <laughs> back to Margaret. Uh, we had a really wonderful conversation with her. Uh, the, the, something that struck me is this emphasis on perfectionism about how people are really suffering, right? That they're really, they're really, uh, troubled by this idea that, you know, unless things are just perfect, things are just going to hell, yeah. you know, that this huge dichotomy. And I thought that this is a time, this, this crisis time is a, is a brutally challenging time for that to be happening. Yeah. And, and the fact that you go, oh, well, maybe 
you know, they're, they're, they're finding meaning in accomplishments and, and maybe working from home and other things. Maybe they don't feel maybe some of the pressure that they would have by being in the office. But what Margaret's saying is no, actually, now they have all these other multiple roles. And so they have to feel perfect in every aspect of it. So it's just layering yeah. these things on. And I can see that. And, and not just people who have, you know, that, that type of depression, but just in general with the world. And I think it's part of some of the quarantine fatigue that we're seeing is this so many new roles that we're taking on and this idea of just trying to survive through these different roles. And then the lack of, you know, community and support and, you know, things that bring us pleasure um, normally that we can't do. We can't go out to a movie. We can't do that. And so people are longing for those. And it just adds that extra burden of expectation and want and then the world that we actually live in. So. Yeah. And at the same time, it's all hidden behind the veil of I have a perfect life. Yeah. Life is good for me. There, yeah. you know, that the exterior message is there's enough meat in the sauce. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm good, right? <laughs> Everything is good for me, but, but that's not was what's happening on the inside. And, yeah. and I thought it was, it was kind of magical the way that she, she crafted the book around this, this, uh, the, not a non-clinical term, but but her insight into how well people can hide depression. Yeah, and I think obviously she's talking about people who act, have a have a clinical depression aspect of this. But what you just said, I think, applies to all of us to a certain degree, right? We we put on that smile, we put on the good face in front of others when they ask how things are going. Oh, good, right? And they may not be. <laughs> Right? It, it can be particularly given the world in which we're living and everything that is going on. It, you know, it's not all ponies and unicorns and rainbows. And yet we that's the image that we often present to the world. Now, I will say, I think recent developments, uh, George Floyd and, and everything that's going on with that, as well as COVID and some of these others, I think has given rise to people being more willing to share at least a little bit like, yeah, as best they um, can be given these situations. And then you can open up that conversation of how are you doing? Well, not, not as good as I'd like. And I think that's a positive piece out of this is just knowing that it's okay, that we're not all living in a Instagram world where life is a beach and we're supermodels and perfect that life can be messy and ugly. And as much as we want to project a perfect world out there, it's okay when it's not. Yeah. It's tough though, that we've got this Facebook depression, this Facebook perfectionism that, that we need to have Instagram perfection. And at the same time, we are, are living in a world where there's a lot of complexities, that we bring different faces of us, different facets of, of ourselves to different situations. I remember um, uh, someone that I knew uh, chastised me for, for being particularly nice to her parents when I, when, I met her, when I met her parents. And she said, you know, you don't have to suck up to my parents. I was like, I wasn't sucking up. I'm just, I'm meeting them for the first time. I'm just, I'm just being cordial. And she's like, yeah, but you know that I don't like them. I'm like, that's not my relationship with them. I get to have a relationship with them that's based on my experience. And, and I thought, you know, and, and she's like, well, you need to adopt my perspective on this. I'm like, no, I, I get to have my own perspective on it. And, and yet that's still just one facet of, of, of who I am. Right. That like they, those, their, her parents were just seeing this tiny little bit of me. They were just seeing this one facet. I was bringing that one facet to them and kind of hiding everything else I, to, to some degree. I mean, if you want to take it to the extreme, I don't know. Yeah. I, I just think that we're, we're complex and, and that, that it can be confusing in a, in a world where we have all these complexities and we have all these layers uh, that it could be easy to say, I'm going to make sure that I really bring the, the, the most, uh, the purest, cleanest, brightest, shiniest, best version of me to the surface. That, and of course, this is where perfection becomes the enemy of good, right? Yeah, 
right? Yeah. Because uh, we can just get obsessed with that. Well, and this idea that we are, you know, we have our own worldview and that worldview influences how the, the context of today impacts us, right? We, we have our own lens that we view things through. So as, as Margaret talked about, you know, the lens that many of these people viewed it is that I have to have these accomplishments. Otherwise I'm not a good person that I have to, that everything has to be perfect or it's not good and add it on with everything that's going on in these times. It just adds that much more stress and it piles it on. That's a different worldview than I have for damn sure, right? Because <laughs> I am right. You can attest to I am not Mr. Perfectionist. I'm right? living the dream, man. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just that understanding of bringing in those different perspectives into conversations and being aware that the person that you're dealing with, so your, you know, person that you talked about, well, this is how my, my relationship with, with my parents is this and yours needs to be that way. No, I have a different worldview and I have a different background and I don't have to share yours, but it's good to understand that. It's good to know that. So yeah, we digress like yeah. we always do. Uh, but I've got a musical question for you. La, 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 la. Not that one. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> a different one. Because my musical, you were going to ask me to sing the la, la, la song, and I was going to have to say that, I'm horrible at that. That was going to be it, but it's not going to be now. Oh, uh, okay. Well, so we're talking about perfection and lack of perfection, and I'm just wondering, what is, do you have like a favorite track uh, where you know that the musicians kind of flubbed, where it wasn't perfect? Was there something yeah. that just wasn't perfect in a, in a particular track? And you're like, oh, yeah, I still love that. You know, I'm sure there's lots of, of songs out there. One of the things that that I, I just don't know if I would even know if they flubbed up, right? I, I, I'm not that musically inclined. You know this about me, right? They could hit the totally wrong chord and I'd be like, oh, that's all right. okay. I didn't realize that. Um, that being said, I, I, I know that there are differences in like the – uh, studio recording of some songs versus the live recording of some songs. And and the pitch is a little bit off or the uh, sound is, you know, maybe there's too much bass going on, um, but there's an emotional component to those sometimes. So the music is off, but there's another aspect of it that I think parlays into that. Um it, it, you know, I, I I'll go back. I'll, I'll go back to maybe a group that you might know, right? Cheap what? trick, cheap what? trick. Yes, right? I do. It, you know, I live at Budokan, guys, yeah. live at Budokan. Okay, right? and and you 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 hear those songs, and they're they're well. And I don't know if they messed up musically or not, but you hear that compared to the the studio version of of some of those same songs, and it's just different. Um, okay. and it's probably, <laughs> and were you expecting like an Eagles kind of performance that exactly replicates the record note for note? See, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's the thing. And, and that's like, there are so many of those times. Uh, so trip Shakespeare, local Minneapolis band from around here, um, that actually Dan Wilson, who left and formed semi-sonic with, with, with John Munson, um, you know, but they were a band. And if you saw them live, you thought these guys are going to be the next huge thing. I mean, it was just such energy and such a great, you know, showmanship and all this other aspects. And musically, again, I, I don't know if they were perfect. I mean, I remember they do this little drum beat to the uh, song they call called The Pants, and they all get up around the drums, and they all beat it. Right. And I know they probably messed up on that at some point. But, man, it was just power. And there was this great energy around it. And then you listen to the songs that they did, the studio albums, and you're kind of going, eh, I'm bored. <laughs> it's like, Ugh. And musically, it was probably perfect. Right. But it didn't have it didn't capture that magic. And so I didn't answer your question, I am sure. But I think there are these things where there there can be magic that happens in imperfection. Yeah. And that is a, a, a wonderful things don't have to be to be magical. You don't have to be perfect. 
that that's there we go yeah that that's that's great of course there's so much affect there's so much emotion in music right that emotion will carry us over logic you know it, it, all the time basically yeah, right yeah uh, but there are really great tracks that uh, have gone down in history with some pretty obvious flubs like um, led zeppelin's black dog you know, okay sk- t- just skip a beat just missed missed a beat. There's it's you know it's, it's supposed to be four four and they just missed it in in one particular bar. They they just missed a beat. Yeah. And you go, but it works, you know. <laughs> and and it was obvious to me as a musician the first time I heard it's it like whoa 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 wait a minute wait a minute I think they just missed a beat on that and in fact they did. But it's like you know the whole the whole song hung together. Um, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young when they recorded Ohio. Like 24 hours after Neil Young wrote it about the Kent State shootings, yeah, you know, there's uh, he started it on the wrong beat. So, so, <laughs> so you kind of have this where you know where's the downbeat, and then yeah. they, they put it together pretty quickly. But there was instantly a, a question about where's the downbeat on this, and yeah. uh, and you know they figured it out. There's a couple of wrong notes in the in leads that are. You know, you might consider Stills was doing some kind of jazzy thing, but he wasn't. I think he just played the wrong notes. <laughs> and, <laughs> but you go, that's that's just part of the history now. That's everlasting. And those are still great takes. You know, there's still really great things. And and there's a part of that that then, again, as you said, some of that emotion pulls you through. But then those mistakes actually become integral to the song. Right. And so yeah. yep. if you heard, you know, that Crosby Stills Nash song, right. And and it didn't have that start, it would feel off now. Right. It, it, exactly. Same thing with Black Dog, right. It, that missed beat. That, it would, you're, it would, you'd be, it you're going, wait, that's, you know, because you've become accustomed to it. And now that yeah. is that song. And so that's the thing I think perfectionists, right. We, we, if we have that perfectionist, um, gene in us if that's what it is or what causes it i don't know i don't have it so i wouldn't i wouldn't understand (laughs) but this idea that hey there's enough meat in the sauce and sometimes sometimes those mistakes are the things that actually make something even more special that they take it beyond because if it's perfect it's planned it's it's programmed it's the uh perfect speech that has every right word, um, every intuition, but there's something that, you know, it's not human, it's not real. And there's an aspect of imperfection that brings the humanity into things that can connect us to it, which I think is a big piece. Thank you for listening to the special episode of Behavior Grooves. We hope that you found it interesting and insightful. If you liked it, please let others know. We think that the topic is important and maybe we can help in educating people about how behavioral science can help us all out in this current craziness that we are going through. Also, please let us know if you have any thoughts or ideas that would be helpful or that we could share. You can reach us through the Connect tab on the Behavior Grooves website at www.behavioralgrooves.com or through Twitter. I am at T. Houlihan and Kurt is at what motivates. We really do love hearing from you. And this topic is one that spurs lots of emotions and thought. As part of our mission, we want to expand and inform the community of people who think about positively applying behavioral science to life. One way that happens is through leaving reviews. If you think this podcast is beneficial and should grow, we would really appreciate to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever podcast server you use. It only takes a few minutes and goes a long way to boost us in the algorithms that are used to generate search results. Also, please check out the show notes. We are linking to a number of resources articles, podcasts, newsletters that we vetted to bring good facts and ideas around COVID-19 and the coronavirus, its impact and ways that we can help slow down the spread. There is a lot of information that's being pushed out to everyone each day, and we are weeding through it to find good stuff so that you don't have to. We truly appreciate you listening. Now go out and wash your hands. 